This is an audio recording of the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. The show is streamed live on Lendit TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. In this fast-paced show, the Lendit News team and a special guest discuss the most important fintech news stories of the past week. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Lended Fintech Weekly News Roundup. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of Lended Fintech, and I'm joined today by my good friend and colleague, Todd Anderson. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good, Peter. How are you? Great. And our special guest is Andrew Dix, the founder of Crowdfund Insider. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing well, Peter. Thank you very much. Good to Great see to you, have Todd. You back. Great yep, to have you too, back Andrew. on. Yep. Let's get right Thank into you. it. We got, we got a lot to cover today. Um First, let's start off with Plaid. They just announced this morning that they are pushing into the payments business. Not a huge surprise. Um, This was talked about when the Visa acquisition was uh, first announced uh, almost two years ago. And now they have, they have really, uh, they've created, uh, um, I I guess it's a product, um, but it's combining, teaming up with a whole bunch of different payments processes to do account to account payments. So basically when you go to checkout, you're going to be able to have, you know, pay with Visa, MasterCard, or Amex, or pay with your bank account kind of thing. And that's, uh, that's going to be, uh, I think, a real, it's, 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 a, it's a real, I mean, it's, it's hard to overstate, I think, how big a deal this is because Plaid is, Plaid is connected to pretty much every bank. And it's going to make, one of the things about bank payments is it's always been a lot of friction and they can put it in with very little friction. It's, it's going to be big. What do you guys think? I think if... If I'm Visa, MasterCard, Amex, I mean, this is a, a direct shot um, at uh, a lot of the fees that um, you know make up their business. Obviously, I think those companies are thinking of ways to to innovate as well. But um, you know, the for the businesses uh, and the consumers alike, um, and recently, I mean, here in New York, uh, there's a lot of uh, businesses, especially the smallest ones, where they have that little sign up, like we're, you know, if you pay by card, it's three percent extra uh, mm-hmm. in terms of your uh, total bill, uh, and they're basically pushing people to use cash so um, they don't get hit on um, the other side in terms of a fee. This takes that away, uh, and obviously that then takes that fee away from whoever the the merchant. Uh, network is uh, and so you know I think it's it's a very interesting deal um, I think the you know announcing it with all those partners and everything I mean they announced it and it was not just hey we're doing this it's hey we're doing this and here's the litany of folks that we're already uh, lined up with and by the way we're connected to 11,000 banks so um, you know, I think it's a pretty big move by them um, I'm curious to see how the whole payments networks end up shaking out over the next few years you have square have kind of tried to close in their network and then you have paypal and 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 their network and you have facebook launching with novi and and stuff like that so it's it's basically the payments network universe has gone from three to like six or seven big players uh in the last couple of years Mm -hmm. yeah i think that uh it's it's a natural step for plaid I mean, first of all, I think very highly of Plaid, and and I'm sure, you know, Visa is very sad that they weren't allowed to go through with the acquisition. Right. Uh, but it's a it's a natural step. It's it's kind of a, a no brainer. I, I think it's just emblematic of the uh, importance and size of the uh, payment infrastructure and the need for disruption and and an overall improvement to the existing rails. And as, as you guys point out, there's a lot of intrinsic f- friction today, and it creates an opportunity for an innovative provider to, to remove that friction, you know, f- create more value for users and for consumers and do it in a, you know, faster, better, less expensive way. It just, it makes sense. Yeah. And this one thing before we move on, I'll add that, that, in, is that small businesses is also, there's, this is a huge, huge deal, I think, for them. I mean, I remember when Australia went to account to account payments, it's like 15, probably 20 years ago, something in the, in the mid, in somewhere in the 2000s. And I know with my brother's family business, we had, 
we moved to like 50% of the customers that used to, a lot of them were paying by check, some would pay by credit card, but they were moved to account, moved bank account to a bank account. And it just was a pretty quick and sudden shift. And because uh, particularly when the accounting software made it really easy, and that, the small business is also going to be in play here for sure. It also makes me think by the time Fed now launches, they'll be so far behind. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think you, that's a, that's an interesting point because a lot of the payment rails today are, are private, mm-hmm. yeah. and you know there's there's a, a solid argument that it should remain that way. But you know that's that's part of also the whole stablecoin CBDC discussion as well. Uh, I think a lot of people view stablecoins as just another payment rail that's in need of, in desperate need of some regulation. Right. Right. Okay, let's move on. We're going to talk about uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin futures. We probably have seen earlier this week the SEC, or well, I think it was last week, the SEC that said they would allow the Bitcoin futures from ProShares to go ahead, and it launched on Tuesday. I haven't actually looked at the stock price today, but it, it had a pretty successful launch, one of the most actively traded ETFs out there. And bullish for Bitcoin. Bitcoin reached a record yesterday uh, on the heels of this announcement. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, it's just another. It's, it's a yet another kind of feather in the in the um, feather in the hat of uh, crypto. It's really been. Uh, you know, they've they've had some sort of turbulent times, but this you know it, it's inevitable. There's going to be an actual Bitcoin ETF. This is a futures ETF, but uh, I, I feel like that's uh, it's a it's a big deal for Bitcoin. I yeah, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Todd. You first. All right. I I think that that. Yeah, it's 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 a step in the right direction for the crypto advocates, but it's it's not a spot based ETF, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about the merits of having a futures based ETF. Honestly, I think Gensler did, doesn't like it. I don't think he likes it at all. I think the fact that it's already a regulated product because Bitcoin futures already traded on the you know CME and CBOE, it's hard for him to say no. Right. Um, and I and I think that 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 if he had had his druthers, he would have said no. But it, it was something he just he just couldn't couldn't avoid. Um, I, I do think that there's a greater likelihood now that a, that a spot based Bitcoin ETF will you know come to fruition. I think it does drive retail interest higher. At the same time. You know, if you're, if you're relatively sophisticated, you can go buy Bitcoin on, you know, SoFi, Robinhood, Coinbase, any number of other platforms and, you know, probably cut out some of those ongoing fees. So, right. you know, a, a single asset ETF, um, yeah, I'm not so hot on it. But, yes, it'll be big for Bitcoin. And, and this one has, you know, heightened interest in, in you know, media headlines on, on it. I feel like it was... Uh a move that they were okay with doing um at the same time they've been you know very um i guess antagonistic uh, is a good way to put it towards you can say antagonistic yes and i feel like i feel like this is one way to say hey we've done something in the lowest risk possible way um and it actually hurts some other things in the near term uh, because they're going to say, let's see how this plays out over time. Um, and you know, I, I personally don't think it really changes much in how the SEC views crypto. I think it's a big moment for crypto, just generally. Um, and I think some of the other stuff going on in the space that we'll talk about later is bigger in terms of retail adoption yeah. and retail awareness of it. But um, I do think this was kind of the SEC trying to have it both ways. Like, hey, we've given you something. Uh, but we're going to keep moving the posts uh, in other products. Um, that That's at least how I saw it. Uh, yep. Because it doesn't seem their their stance overall hasn't really changed. Right. And they, and yeah, so the goalposts, uh, they can move them again at any time. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, f- let's talk about Facebook. Um, Facebook selected Coinbase as their custody partner. Uh, Paxos, uh, the stable coin. Uh, the Novi users, Novi is the is the Facebook um, digital wallet that that uh, I think is already in like alpha testing right now. Um, and you know they chose. It's interesting that you know 
Paxos is not one of the big stable coins. It's not USDC. It's not USDT. Uh, USDP, as in Paul, as in Paxos. Um, but it's, um, you know, they've they've chosen that. They said they really wanted something that was, you know, 100% uh, 100 backed by actual, you know, actual cash and cash equivalents. So it's, um, you know, Facebook continue to move forward. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not a big Facebook fan, but <laughs> who is? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but but I think it it it's uh, has the potential to be be a a good move for for Facebook. That being said, I think uh, Libra was a train wreck, and yeah. I, I really don't think that they had a good grasp of what they were doing, even though they had some very, you know, accomplished and, and intelligent people running that show. It just made no sense. I mean, they were going to do a, a, a regulatory brick wall on that. And over time, they've scaled back their ambitions as they had to. And a Diem, which they say they, they are still committed to, is in effect a, a stablecoin project that, um, that they say is going to eventually be a, a, a digital dollar if they can get regulated. And, you know, so many policymakers don't like Facebook. I don't know. Maybe a bit of a stretch. Now, Paxos on the other, fan, other side, it's a firm that I think is awesome. And they are more of an infrastructure provider and they work with some really big, you know, fintechs like, uh, like PayPal. I think they power PayPal's. Uh, crypto um, backend stuff, uh, and they know their stuff. They're regulated. They were compliance first, so I think that was a smart move for uh, Facebook to get out in the market with a a payments process. Nuvi's a digital wallet. You know, there's umpteen different digital wallets. They said it'll be connected with everything. It makes a lot of sense. Will they make that next step to have DM actually be a stable coin? I don't know. But I think this is a good move for them. And, of course, they've got hundreds of millions of users on WhatsApp and, tele and Instagram and, of course, Facebook. And uh, it's, it's a big step for them into fintech. Yep. I think Facebook keeps changing their mind. And they and changing <laughs> kind of, their name next. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> they, I think overall, I think it's, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out where they fit best in the space. And I think the... I think they got themselves in trouble with that whole Libra launch versus they could have been doing some of this stuff just in the background, doing small announcements, you know, small iterative um, things uh, versus like this huge splash, which then backfired. Uh, and they've kind of gone backwards since then versus, Hey, here's a little thing. Here's a, and we, our perception of it would have been, Hey, they're building to something here versus, they splashed, got knocked down, and now they're kind of you know renaming things, kind of jumping around. That, that's the way I view it. I feel Maybe, like they've gone the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Versus, versus creating a global non-sovereign currency that was right. in effect a security. <laughs> yeah, you know, via you know the regulations in the United States. I mean, what were you thinking? Um, yeah. It just yeah, I, I, and. It was it was misguided from from day one. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, since it launched, the Facebook brand has actually suffered much worse uh, in the eyes of regulators with uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the things that have happened. So, when was the last time Facebook, when you saw them on on you know CNBC or whatever, that it was for a good reason? <laughs> 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 that tells you a lot about Facebook. I mean, it, yeah. even this morning they had news that came out that the, uh, you know, the way that they uh, exempt certain high level users uh, wasn't clear, uh, according to their, you know, the whatever review board or whatever they call it. Right. Yeah, people are already mocking the name change, calling it yes. Boomer Book or, or Woke Book or, or whatever. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. Whatever the name change is, people, people are going to crucify them for it no matter what. Anyway, let's move on. I um, want to talk about PayPal. And this was not on my M&A bingo card, but uh, PayPal looking <laughs> to – they're in late-stage talks to acquire Pinterest. And I haven't logged on to Pinterest in years. Not that I was ever really a, 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 a heavy user, but uh, I, um, you know, I went on. I went on the site yesterday, and it's it's basically the same as what it what it what it used to be. It, I'm sure there's a few more ads and stuff, but they're talking about thirty nine billion dollars um, for uh, for Pinterest 
And, you know, they're saying the Shopify is applying, is applying pressure to pay. PayPal is really, you know, not, hasn't got as much in the way of like social commerce. I, I, I don't know. I feel like this one doesn't seem like a natural fit to me. What do you guys think? I mean, it, I agree. It doesn't feel like a natural fit though. And how I understand Pinterest, I mean, this is basically through how my wife uses it is, you know, there's a lot of like small, especially like more sole proprietor types um, that use it to essentially get the the word out about, um, you know, stuff that they're doing, whether it be, you know, designs for, you know, things that they make like pacifiers for, for kids or, um, you know, t-shirts or, you know, little side hustle type things. Um, and I guess you could relate that back to, you know, they need payment mechanisms, um, and connecting that through PayPal. Um, you know, I, I certainly think the social commerce thing has a, an angle to it. I mean, it still doesn't feel like the, the perfect fit, but, um, you know, there's, there's so much happening right now. Sometimes we don't see it at the start. And then all of a sudden, in two years, it's this great product that, that PayPal has re-engineered. So mm-hmm. I don't know. They must see something there. And PayPal usually makes smart moves. So I, I look at it slightly different. I, th- I look at it as a foot in the door because, um, you know, Pinterest is 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 the the uh, you know the cheap kid on the block right now. I, I don't. I don't know how million dollar cheap kid. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you look at, at how much Facebook paid for its acquisitions like Instagram and WhatsApp. The, the thing is, is, is Instagram or Facebook is moving into to payments and fintech and PayPal saying, you know, wait a minute, these guys are moving in on me. I think I need to move in the other direction. So they acquire a, an established social network that has some cool features and functions and then, like everybody else, you start rolling them out new ones, adding new features and functionality. If you look at how uh, you know quickly uh, TikTok evolved in Snap, which is the choice of a, a younger generation, uh, it was pretty pretty amazing. Um, but they've always been very iterative to the point that everybody else has to say, "Hey, what are they doing? I need to copy that." So I think you know for PayPal. In a lot of ways, it's the meshing of, you know, social communication with financial services kind of makes sense. Well, we'll have to see if they can actually monetize it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because this, this whole social commerce space is really nascent and barely even going now. And, a little bit, you know, when you that, – that, that's, that's what the commentary that I've read is. It's, that it's really about that piece. But anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. I want to talk about the New York Attorney General, who <laughs> I think has screwed up to be honest. Um, She's running for governor. Yeah. Well, she sent, she sent cease and desist um, to two crypto lending firms uh, this week. Everyone thought it was like next, Nexo was one of them and they don't even offer the product that, uh, that they were, <laughs> that, that they were told to cease and desist. That was pretty easy for them. Cause they said they don't offer it. They must've um, got into their brains and said they're in the future. They're going to offer this. We'll right. just send it to them right away. <laughs> and then uh, like Celsius was the other one that everyone said. And Celsius apparently did not receive a cease and desist. And I spent, I spent like 15 minutes this afternoon before we came on on the air and tried to find out who were these companies that were sent it. And they're still, it's 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 been kept pretty pretty tight. I mean, I would have thought BlockFi would have got one. They they haven't been mentioned. I mean, they said so. They said two cease and desist letters and three letters for people requesting to companies requesting more information. And we we know that Nexo Nexo and Celsius were two of them. We don't know who the others are. And it's. Uh, it's a little bizarre to me the whole um, this whole process, this whole you know episode. Feels like the regulators are like you know shooting shots across the bow, and then like oh, we'll just worry about the details later. Um, when in reality, I mean they you know th- this should be this is pretty simple stuff. Like this is who we want to uh, send these letters to sent, and you know it's seems like they they're not aware of what some of these companies do it's like amateur hour and so and the, and the people were they found out the names of the companies by the file name it was redacted but the file name had the company name in it so which that's was just that's bizarre. that feels amateur hour as you say yeah I, I think that they 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 know who these they know who these people are but they don't care I think it's it's you know the the memo's been distributed from you know washington dc on down and, and people are just kind of falling into line to 
act out what is policy. It, it really was, uh, I think it was Gensler who first who targeted um, crypto lenders and the fact that they, they're, yep. he said there were securities and they needed additional regulation. And, and I think for Letitia James, who clearly has aspirations beyond <laughs> attorney general of, of New York, and yep. I would expect that, you know, she's profile enough that she would uh, run for governor at some point in time. Uh, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a layup for her because most people don't understand this except for the, the people on the inside. Um, you know, they, 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 uh, paint it up and, you know, we're, we are protecting investors, the little guy, even though I've never read anything about anybody complaining about yeah. earning cons- eight, eight and a quarter percent on a savings account when you get a negative real rate of return in a bank. I mean, I just, you know, I'm like, you know, you know, who's the bad guy here? Right. It's just, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't really make sense because yeah, no, they're, they're not, you know, FDIC insured, but you know that going in. And if you're holding BTC or Ethereum or something and you want to park it and you want to generate some, some, you know, some return on that or, or USDC or whatever, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a no brainer. And, uh, you know, platforms like, you know, BlockFi and some of these other places have always been compliance first. They've always been, you know, out there about, you know, we want to be a regulated financial services firms, you know, uh, laying the groundwork for, you know, the bank or the service of the future. It makes a lot of sense. So when you have a, a, a politician like this really gunning for a service that I don't see really causing any harm that I'm not aware of, it just, you know, it just smacks of politics, yeah. partisan politics. Who's complaining? Where's the, where, like, where's the harm? Who's, who's, because most of this stuff is, I would have thought, are people complaining to the New York Attorney General or, or anyone, or the CFPB or anybody saying, oh my goodness, this is wrong. I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't be allowed to do this. It's just, uh, it feels kind of goes crazy. back to misunderstanding of the actual product, politics, as Andrew said. And also the, the the simplified nature of oh it's not FDIC insured so well, well how do we deal with that? Well, it's like, yeah. well, if no one's complaining, they know the risk going into it that it's not FDIC insured, but they're willing to take that risk to make that eight percent. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it goes back to the problem is 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 you elect somebody to be a representative or a senator or whatever. And then they go there and they legislate. Um, and that's where the problem lies, because instead of removing rules and friction and reducing regulations, they go and create more. And that's how they show that they are effective and, and how they accomplish you know, what they set out to do and, and how they get reelected. And, and yep. uh, it just creates a, a, a poor motivation for public officials. Right. Well, that's a whole other can of worms, which we are not, uh, <laughs> we're not going to open. Don't okay. get me started. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Okay. So uh, next up, we have PIMCO, which, um, I mean, they're the world's largest fixed income asset manager, and uh, they are now dabbling in crypto. I don't know what uh, what Bill Gross would have thought, Mohammed Al Arian, but uh, those guys are no longer around for Pimco, and they are they now um you know, they they're, they're going to do it gradually, and you can see you can see it, it it's driven by their investors. It seems like the, the, this is though this is the the type of firm that when they get involved can help change the the minds of uh you know regulators and mm-hmm. because they become powerful enough when banks start getting into this uh in in bigger numbers then it the conversation shifts to oh it's this you know community over here they're startups they're they're kind of on the edges of the financial system no these are the the players in the financial system so when stuff like this starts to happen that's when uh you know the crypto community should be like all right we need to lean into how can we get more Pimco likes, um, you know, to begin to to dabble, uh, so they can get on our side, uh, because I think that's when the bigger change happens, um, and it's you know clearly it's a it's a natural evolution of hey we're being asked this so we need to find out how to uh, you know best best get involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think when you have somebody the size of Pimco, which has over two tr- trillion in assets under management, which is which is pretty big. Uh, making making <laughs> making a move into crypto, it says something. And the the CIO who went on CNBC to discuss it said, "Look, you know, we're getting demand from 
from you know our, our investors. Uh, it just makes sense. Uh, but you know, clearly they're going to be they've started and they're doing more. You know they're dabbling in. I think most of what they're doing right now is for the hedgies. Uh, but you know, in a diversified portfolio environment, crypto is becoming a recognized asset class where, that you can use to not only to hedge but to speculate and perhaps invest. And it just it just makes sense. Pimco is another stamp of approval from the old guys of finance. Yep, yep. Okay, moving on to a new guys in finance, uh, FTX <laughs> trading. We've seen, um, and many of us have seen the ads with FTX. It's got Tom Brady and Gisele, and it's actually quite a humorous ad um, that um, – Talk, you know, basically promoting FTX. Tom Brady has uh, has some equity in the company, and I, I'm looking at your the piece that you wrote, Andrew, earlier today. I was actually blown away by some of these things. It's just amazing. Like they founded it two years ago. They just create. They just uh, they up their 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 regular Series B is now one billion dollars, and now this Series B one is another four hundred twenty five million at a twenty five billion dollar valuation. I mean. This this company is it's it's just staggering. This would it's have if, you would have if you told me this ten years ago that a company would be founded and then do something like this two years later. I said that's just simply impossible. You can't do that. It's happening. I think I think the founder Sam is just he, he's brilliant. Uh, he's he really you know looked at what was working, what wasn't. Uh, he had the toolkit, the, the horsepower to do something, and he did it. And, you know, there's something to be said for execution and, and, you know, they're, they're doing what's right. You can see that in the growth numbers and the fact that you raise money at that type of valuation in such a short amount of time. You're right. It's staggering. Absolutely staggering. I thought it was interesting to note that they have offshore um, operations to the Bahamas, which in my opinion, highlights a deficiency in the U.S. regulatory environment. Now they still have FTX.us where they've got like kind of a scaled down version of it. Um, but I think it, it just, you know, points to the fact that the U.S. has been behind on this. And I think they should do a better job of getting ahead of faci facilitating innovation, but keeping it regulated as opposed to, you know, reg, you know, regulation by enforcement and, you know, pumping the brakes too often when they should be hitting the accelerator. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen him. I mean, they've been everywhere. If you watch any of the baseball games, I mean, the, it was one of the first playoff games on Fox, and they had the little – there was an FTX guy who had, like, the wooden head or whatever, um, and they, he was moving around the ballpark, and Fox kept going to him. And then there would be an FTX commercial every break. Uh, and that's how you get mass market is get on the baseball games, the football games, where people are the weekends, and – um, you know, you get in front of people and then people start Googling what's FTX, what's crypto. And you remember, it was, I think it was, was it last year or this year that they got the naming rights for the Miami Heat uh, Stadium um, uh, Coliseum or whatever it's called. Yeah. You know, when they did that, I was like, huh? You know, because it was American Airlines who had it before. And now we have a crypto exchange. It's pretty incredible. And, they, and they've and they signed some other, uh, you know, branding promotional agreements, which are, which are pretty cool, too. Yep. I go back to when we were first, when it first happened with SoFi, it was like, why? You know, this is so crazy. The Super Bowl's there this year, and you can't get away from the word SoFi during an NFL game. Yep. Well, the Rolling Steve. Stones just played there like a week ago. It's just, yeah, they're, they're, SoFi is everywhere right now. 160 million people watch the Super Bowl, so they'll be right. hearing SoFi, 160 million people. Yep. Yep. Anyway, uh, we're almost out of time. Last, last story I want to talk about another fundraise. Uh, N26, uh, Challenger Bank, they're actually they operate here in the US. Um, they're not that big, but they raised $900 million at a $9 billion valuation, which ordinarily that would that would blow us all away. But of course, these days, that's just a regular run of the mill digital digital banking funding round, right? But uh, <laughs> seed round, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, I mean, the, the, it really, I mean, this is a very impressive round, but it's, you know, it, it's not unique anymore. And uh, the interesting thing that they're refocusing on the EU. It's what, it's, what the, the articles uh, that have been out there talked about and, and getting ready to IPO three to four years down the track. So I thought, you know, Peter, you maybe it was in one of our many calls that we have every week. And you were <laughs> like, you know, we thought N26 was, was kind of on the downside. They had left the UK. Um, they haven't really taken off here in the US. Though. I think they've done some 
some better things in the U.S. than maybe they get credit for. It's kind of more under the radar. They haven't made as splashy a move into the U.S. But, um, you know, then they raise the round. Uh, and you find out, you know, 7 million customers in 25 countries. Uh, and now they have clearly plenty of cash uh, to double down on Europe, which is obviously where their uh, initial uh, market was. So, um, you know, clearly they're not dead. Yeah. And, and we keep seeing these, these, we don't think the funding rounds can get any bigger for a digital bank or neobank, but they do time right. and time again. It, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, what I find interesting because domestically within the United States is um, I think it was Monzo and one other uh, announced that they were no longer going to pursue a, a federal bank charter. Mm-hmm. And I think that has to do with the transition in administration where you had, uh, the OCC was at one point much more open to innovation, and now they've transitioned to someplace else. And, and I think that's going to cool down uh, banking innovation for a while. And I think that's that's unfortunate. I do think for the the providers, the true digital banks that have a federal bank charter, that creates a bigger moat for them and an opportunity to do more because – you aren't going to have these other people, you know, nipping at your heels uh, as as soon as as I anticipated. And I think that bodes well for, you know, Avero. It bodes well for Lending Club and, and Bank. It bodes well for uh, for Marcus. I mean, these people that have a, a, a bank charter minus any bank branches, it's a good position to be. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, I did. A, I recorded a podcast earlier today with Gary Reader from the American FinTech Council. His reading on the OCC was that bank charters for fintechs dead, dead for, yeah. for the time being. So it's dead for the time being. And if, <laughs> if um, I can't think of her name right now, the person that they've selected or appointed to, to run the OCC actually gets gets approved in that role, that will be disastrous. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway. We've run out of time. Andrew, thank you very much. Todd, it's always a Thanks, pleasure. Andrew. And uh, we'll be back same time next week. Before I go, though, one quick one quick reminder to everybody, Latin America is still the hottest region on the planet when it comes to fintech. We have Lender Fintech Latam happening December 7th and 8th. Go to lender.com to find out more. With that, we'll I wish you all a good afternoon and a good uh, weekend. We'll be back same time next week. See ya. See ya. Thank you, everybody.